In Luke chapter 11, the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. What was his response? Find out next on 41 Strong. Good morning. All right, all right, all right. Welcome to 41 Strong. Chuck Tate coming to you live from Widecast Studios in downtown Peoria, Illinois on a crisp, chilly November morning. Feels more like January than it does November right now. 41 Strong is a podcast that delivers encouraging scriptures and stories to help people like you hold on and stand strong. And today, is episode 151, and we are going to unpack the subject of prayer. So my question for you is this, do you know how to pray? Let me ask you another question. Have you ever asked God for something? Have you ever approached God on behalf of somebody else? And if the answer is yes, then guess what? You've, you've prayed. Have you blessed your food? Do you ask God to bless your food regular, regularly? Do you, do you pray before, before you eat? Well, I, I want to begin by sharing real quick five purposes of prayer. And then we're going to find out what Jesus said not to do concerning prayer. And then we're going to answer the question that the disciples asked, teach us how to pray. All right, so real quick, though, five purposes of prayer. Number one, prayer is a conversation with God. It's talking, it's listening to God, it's communicating with God, all right? And that includes not just talking, not just telling God what you want, but listening to God and opening up the word and letting God speak back to you. Second purpose of prayer is this. Prayer is the way to communicate with God by talking and listening. So it's a conversation, it's communication, it's both. Number three, prayer is a way to petition God. God does want us to tell him what we need. He does want us to approach him boldly. The word of God says to come boldly to the throne that we might obtain. All right. It says in the New Testament to make our petitions known to him. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. <clears throat> So that includes petitions, telling God what we need. Fourth purpose of prayer is prayer is a way for us to intercede for others. This is when we approach God on behalf of somebody else. And number five, the fifth purpose of prayer, it's a way to surrender to God. When we approach God and we say, God, I messed up. I need to go all in. Forgive me. This is where we confess our sins. This is where we repent of our sins. And 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, no matter what it is. And that's good news today. You can have your sins wiped out. And the good news is goes even further because you can have the guilt and shame associated with those sins wiped out. All right, so I want to go to Luke chapter 11, verse 1. It says, once Jesus was in a certain place and he was praying, and as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus responded like this. He said, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then that's where we get the Lord's Prayer from. So we're going to unpack the Lord's Prayer in just a moment. But before we go through that, Jesus addressed some things we shouldn't do when we pray. So I want to knock that out before we unpack the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, Jesus said, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that's all the reward they will get. So in other words, Jesus is saying, prayer is not a show. 
And there are people, and there were people in his day, the Pharisees, that wanted to be seen. They were more about being noticed than they were actually having a conversation with God. So Jesus said, when you pray, don't do that. Don't be like that. It's not about getting noticed, like, oh, oh, hey, they're watching me. Oh, yes, God. And people want to appear more spiritual than they are or, quote, super spiritual. And Jesus said, this is this is between me and you. All right. This is between you and the father. So he said this. So when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private, then your father who sees everything will reward you. So there is an example that he laid out. You don't have to pray to where you can be seen, but get away privately in a secret place because it's between you and God. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't pray corporately in a, in a church service or a gathering of other believers. It's okay to come together and to, to pray out loud in a, in a group of people. But there is, it is, it's vital that we also have a private prayer life. And Jesus modeled this. Even though Jesus was busy laying hands on the sick and casting out demons and teaching his disciples and traveling all over the place, he always made time to get alone with the Father. Sometimes it was before the sun even came up where he would bust out to go pray. Sometimes it was late in the evening where he would sneak off and get away from the crowds to go pray. So we need to make sure that we are spending time with God in private. All right, that's what he said. Verse 7 says, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need before you even ask it, right? Now, Jesus isn't saying that we shouldn't repeat ourselves, and he's not telling us that we can't come before him about the same thing more than once. What he's saying is don't be like the Pharisees who were reciting words. The prayer wasn't a conversation with God coming from their heart. They were just using repetition to repeat idle words, babbling on and on. Again, they wanted to be seen. They wanted to be noticed. There was no power in their words. So God wants our prayers, our conversation with him to come from our heart, just like we would talk with the best friend, just like we would talk with the spouse, somebody we're sitting next to at the airport, wherever, on a plane. He wants us to have a conversation with him. He wants us to come to him. He wants us to have that relationship. Being a Christian, is a re- it's a relationship, right? We have a relationship with God through Jesus, and he's praying for us. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us on our behalf, cheering us on. So we need to take the time to talk to him, to get alone privately. There's times where we come together and pray corporately. The important thing is that we do it. And the Apostle Paul says, pray continuously. The word says, pray without ceasing. We should always be in an attitude of prayer. So we can pray when we're driving um, in our car. We can pray when we're laying in our bed. We can pray sitting in a rocking chair at home or on the couch. Wherever you go, you can pray wherever you go. The important thing is that we do it. That we make a intentional, all right, to be intentional about spending time in prayer. All right, so how do we pray then? All right, that's, I know, okay, I get it, Chuck. I'm supposed to pray. How do I pray? Well, that's the same thing. That's the same question the disciples asked. Jesus teaches to pray. We see you pray. You, you take off and you pray privately. Sometimes we see you praying. In front. Teach us to pray. And Jesus responded with this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That has become known as the Lord's Prayer. And a lot of you that are watching right now, a lot of you that are listening right now, 
you have that memorized. And if you don't have it memorized, you're close to having it memorized. You've heard it enough or even recited it enough to where you know it. The question is, do you know what it means, right? Jesus wasn't saying every time you pray to pray that exact same prayer. He was modeling how to approach God. He was modeling how we pray. And it's okay to recite it, okay? But if that is the only time you ever pray is to recite that, then you're babbling on and on and you're just reciting words, okay? Again, prayer is a conversation with God. It's talking and listening. It's communicating with God. So let's break down what Jesus meant when he modeled the Lord's Prayer. We'll begin with the very first phrase, our Father, which art in heaven, all right? This is in, in verse 9. So notice that Jesus didn't direct his disciples to begin their prayers with our God, Almighty Jehovah, hello Yahweh, dear Lord baby Jesus, right? Um, he said, our Father. He's pointing out that we approach God as the Father. He's reminding us that God is our Father. And there are some people that have a hard time approaching the Father because of the relationship they have or have had with their earthly father. So some people have this distorted view of our Heavenly Father because of their biological father. And we want you to know that God is in no way can be compared to your earthly dad. All right, God loves you. He's for you. He is the one who created you. And Jesus isn't saying it's wrong to start our prayer by saying, you know, by God, I need you. He's, it's not wrong to say Jesus, to uh, approach Jesus in prayer. He, but in this model, Jesus uses approaching the Father by calling him out as Father, all right, because we are his, his children. All right. I don't know if you've if you've um, seen the the movie with Will Ferrell. I can't even remember the name of it, but um, his prayer went something like this: We thank thank you so much for this bountiful harvest of Domino's, KFC, and the always delicious Taco Bell. And he approached God as a baby Lord Jesus. All right, but Jesus he modeled prayer by saying, "Our." Father. So of all the words and of all the titles for God that Jesus could have used to initiate this model of prayer for his disciples, Jesus chose the word Father. So the Greek word Father is the word pater. And this word pater in the, Arab, in the Aramaic, which is the language that Jesus spoke, is the word Abba. That's right, Jesus didn't speak English. He spoke Aramaic. All right, so this term, Abba, is translated as great intimacy, or it's a term of great intimacy and affectionate respect. All right, so it was normally the first word that a child would utter. All right, so what, what does this mean? We approach God as his beloved children. All right, I'm a dad. I love my kids. I will never get tired of my kids asking me, me for things. I mean, there are times where... Um, I mean, it does weigh on me. Like, hey, Dad, can I have this? I need this. I want that. I want, you know, at the same time, I, I, I don't care. I want them to approach me. I don't want them to be afraid of me. I want them to approach me. Sometimes the answer is no. You know, hey, Dad, can I get this pair of shoes? No, because we bought you shoes a month ago, and we bought you new shoes two months before that. So guess what? We're not going to buy any shoes for a while. The answer is no. But I still want them to approach me. I don't get tired of that. I'm their dad. I want them to crawl up on lap and sit down and talk to me and to approach me. All right, I have a relationship with my kids and God wants to have that same kind of relationship with us because he's the very one who created us. He is, he saw you before you were created. You're his masterpiece. Ephesians 2.10 says we're his workmanship and he saw us before we were conceived doing great deeds. So he wants us to have that relationship and he wants him to approach us as Abba Father, you know, Papa, Daddy, right? All right, number two, the second phrase that we will take a look at is, hallowed be thy name. So our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I want to point out that God's not a genie in a bottle. So our chief concern in prayer is that God would be honored and glorified. All right? He's not a genie in a bottle where we just come to him, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. Hey, God, I need this. I want this. Give me this. You know, he's not a genie. 
All right. His name is to be kept holy. And our chief concern in prayer is that he's honored and that he is glorified. All right. Um, the Passion Translation says this, may the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. So God wants to be at the center of everything that we do. He doesn't want to be at the top of our list, just like checking a box. He wants to be the, at the center of everything on the list. All right. He wants to be the center of the list. All right. Number three, the third phrase, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, this statement teaches us that prayer is a partnership in which we join with God to accomplish his purposes here on the earth. So not everything that takes place on the earth is the will and desire of God. So Jesus invites us to join God to see his kingdom extended throughout the earth. The Passion, the passion Translation lays it out like this. Cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth just as it is fulfilled in heaven. And Jesus, he modeled this, all right? This is the exact prayer that he prayed when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew that he was about be, to be betrayed. He knew that he was going to be beaten and whipped and nailed to a cross. So as he was agonizing over this moment in the garden, sweating drops of blood, he didn't want to go through with it. He did go through with it. All right. But when he was praying to the father, he said, father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Let me read it to you. Mark chapter 14, verse 36. Jesus cried, Abba, Papa. He cried, Abba, everything is possible for you. So please take this cup of suffering away from me. But then he added this. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And that needs to be our posture. When we approach God and we're talking to God and we're praying to God, we need to pray, okay, God, this is, this is what, what I really want. This is what I need. But ultimately, I want your will to be done, not my will. Because I know my will can get jacked up. I know my heart can get wicked. I know I can get off course. I know I can go left when I'm supposed to be going straight. I know I can end up going right when I'm supposed to go straight. Sometimes I veer off the road. So God... Ultimately, I want your will to be done, not my own. So let's pray for God's will to be done, because God knows best, right? So if he's the one leading us and guiding us and making every crooked way straight, I tell you what, our life's going to go so much better when we're walking in his will, when we're being obedient to him. All right, verse four, or number four, the, the fourth phrase in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. All right? So this is where Jesus is teaching us that it's okay to ask God to meet our daily needs. All right? It's okay to approach God and say, hey, God, this is what I... He knows our needs before we even ask Him, but He wants us to ask Him. He wants us to, to go to Him. Martin Luther said this about this phrase, give us this day our daily bread. Martin Luther said bread is a symbol for everything necessary for the preservation of this life. Like food, a healthy body, good weather, a house, a home, wife, children, good government, and peace. Uh, I'm going to add good government, right? I mean, right now, things are crazy in our nation. So impeachment proceedings have begun today. We need to pray for our president. We need to pray for everyone in every office. We need to pray for all the politicians. We need to pray that God's will is done in our nation, right? So this give us this day our daily bread is not limited to praying about bread. This is about approaching God with our needs, approaching God with our petitions, all right? God wants to provide what's necessary for us to live. All we have to do is ask. James says, you have not because you ask not, all right? But we also want to pray in accordance to his will. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart, all right? So not just your needs, but God also wants to answer your prayers about your desires. That's pretty cool. All right, number five, the fifth phrase in the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. All right, confess, repent, release. Jesus models forgiveness. When we approach God, we need to take time to 
ask him to forgive us. We need to repent of our sins, but we also need to release those who have sinned against us. Even if they're not sorry, we have to release it. We have to forgive. If we want to be forgiven, we have to forgive. See, the enemy, we talked about this in our three-part series on deliverance and freedom. The enemy, one of his strategies is to get you to be bitter because of what's been done to you. And we already know that bitterness doesn't hurt the person we're bitter against. It hurts us. It destroys us. It kills us. In fact, Jesus said if we harbor bitterness in our heart, we're turned over to the tormentors. All right? You're going to be harassed the rest of your life if you can't learn to forgive. Forgiveness is not being okay with the sin that's been done to you, but it's releasing them from it so God can take care of them. So God will deal with it. So forgiveness is not for the other person. Forgiveness is for you. So Jesus said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Another translation says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Another translation says, God, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. So say it out loud. Confess, repent, release. Confess, repent, release. All right. Um, One of my good friends, Mike Crawl, said this. Don't let someone who didn't die for you affect how you worship someone who did. Man, that's a mic drop right there. No pun intended. Psalms 139, 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Man, we need God to reveal the dark areas of our heart. And we need to repent of those dark areas. We need to ask God to forgive us, all right? We need to make allowance for each other's faults. We need to forgive anyone who offends us, all right? Why? Because Jesus forgave us, so we need to forgive others. Jesus also modeled that on the cross. Do you remember what he said when he was on the cross? He said, God, burn them all, right? Kill them. No, he didn't say that. What did Jesus pray when he was on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Man, that's powerful. We need to do the same. All right, the sixth phrase of the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The New Living Translation says, don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Right? 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, there's no temptation that we can't escape from. God always provides a way of escape. So this is the part of prayer when we ask God to deliver us from our temptation so we don't give in to sin. You know, this is a a great opportunity for us to ask God to reveal our blind spots so we can correct those and we can get ourselves right. We can get our heart right, get our mind right, get our motives right. I love, uh, I want to close with this. There's a prayer of, of, of Jabez and this prayer is just a short little prayer. It's in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. And it's about a guy whose name literally meant pain. And here's what he prayed. It says this, Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, that you would enlarge my territory, and that your hand would be with me, that you would keep me from evil. Why? So that I may not cause pain. That's a great prayer. God, keep me from evil because I don't want to cause pain. I don't want to cause pain on myself. I don't want to inflict pain on myself. I don't want to cause pain to uh, affect. I don't want my actions to affect my wife, to affect my kids, to affect my church, to affect my friends. I don't want to be stupid. God, reveal my blind spots. Keep me from evil. Provide a way of escape. May I be smart enough to take the escape route. Jesus, help me. And then the seventh phrase of the Lord's Prayer, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's all about Jesus. Everything. So let's approach him. Let's talk to him. If you will take the Lord's Prayer and you will break it down phrase by phrase like we just did, and you will pray the way Jesus modeled, you will learn how to pray for a while. If you spent five minutes on each phrase, you know, confessing, repenting, releasing, praying for God's will, bringing your petitions to him, interceding for for others, guess what? You're going to be able to pray for 15, 20 minutes. All right, there you go. Now, for those of you that thought, well, I can't even pray longer than 30 seconds. No, you're wrong. You can. And Jesus teaches us how. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he did.
Check out the Lord's Prayer. Get alone with God and start talking and listening to Him today. All right, we're out of time. Another episode of 41 Strong is in the can. So for our producer, Mike Sable, I'm Chuck Tate. I can't wait to see you next week. For more information about 41 Will Come or 41 Strong, go to my website, chuckytate.com or 41willcome.com. And don't forget, there's a 41 Will Come reading reading plan that more than 10,000 people have completed on the YouVersion Bible app. So take advantage of that. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. PeoriaLife.com.